All right. Good hour of the day. Um, my name is um, Suhel Al Janabi. I'm the co manager of the ABS Capacity Development Initiative. And I would like to welcome you to our first post GBF webinar on digital sequence information. Whereas today uh, we'll uh, have chosen the theme of uh, looking into DSI in the different fora at the international level that are dealing with, um, with that subject matter. And it is, uh, as in the past, the webinar uh, being supported uh, by the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and uh, the South African uh, Ministry of Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment under the Norwegian South African Partnership. Um, by the ABS Capacity Development Initiative. So welcome to everyone. And um, as in the past, uh, we uh, will provide this uh, webinar in different languages. So it is held in English, but it has uh, simultaneous interpretation in French and in Spanish. And uh, you will see that at the bottom line of um, your uh, screen. Um, so please um, uh, use the language of your choice. And I believe this is uh, uh, working in um, the Zoom app and uh, maybe not in the, in the browser version. Uh, there's also a chat that we'll have enabled. I'll say some words on the chat in a second. And if you want to contribute to the chat, um, uh, in, please do this in English. Um, you can, of course, use then Deeple uh, or Google Translate to uh, contribute uh, then in, in English. About the chat, um, we uh, want to, of course, have a, an interactive uh, webinar. So we will allow at the end of um, the, um, the webinar to, um, to have some, some questions uh, and, and, and comments. Uh, um, as you see, the chat is enabled uh, <clears throat> for questions and substantive uh, technical as well as conceptual contributions. And uh, please use this send to everyone when you're sending out the message. Um, we will collect um, what is being um, put in the chat as questions and as, um, as contributions. And um, then um, try to uh, set up a moderated feedback round at the end of um, the, the webinar to the panelists so um, that uh, specific clusters and uh, um, of, of questions and, and contributions could then be addressed to the panelists. Um, the points that will not be uh, addressed due to time reasons, I will definitely use them to inform uh, and support the further process and also for the webinars and uh, um, please uh, refrain uh, from from uh, disrespectful comments uh, to panelists and because um, those would need uh, those wouldn't be answered and cannot be tolerated may lead to removal from the webinar but um, with this chat ticket i believe we can uh, work uh, very well now, um, what is it that we have uh, today on our agenda? We will have a short welcome note by um, South Africa and um, Norway. Um, we will um, have a walk through the uh, current state of play um, of DSI decisions and negotiations in the different international fora by my colleague Hartmut Meyer. And there will be um, a very interesting panel uh, being uh, moderated by Timothy Hodges uh, that uh, comprises Margot Begley, Daniel Kacheri, Swery Moon, and Daniele Manzella. We'll say some words on the panelists in a minute. And then, of course, some further announcement, uh, closing remarks, uh, uh, and in between the questions from the chat as time allows. Now, um, I hope that uh, uh, from uh, our good friends from Norway and from um, South Africa colleagues have, have arrived. So, uh, Gauta, could you maybe uh, start with a welcome address? Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Suhel. I trust you can hear me and maybe see me as well. Uh, they're all welcome to the seminar organized by the South Africa Norway Bilateral Partnership, facilitated by the ABS Capacity Development Initiative. First, I must say I'm very pleased with the impact the partnership has had, which resulted in the adaptation of the Kuming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework and the decision on DSI. The Global Dialogue on DSI under the South Africa Norway Bilateral Partnership was established to foster informal exchanges, but also to increase the knowledge base on DSI. We are now in the implementation phase of the framework. In Turkey in October next year, we will have the DSI mechanism up and running, hopefully. Uh, consideration of digital sequence information in the CBD and other UN fora is a great place to start the conversation. As you know, uh, the Intergovernmental Conference of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS, just agreed on a legally binding agreement on the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction, where DSI also played a very central role, just as it did um, in Montreal in December. The relationship to the CBD mechanism was in the forefront of these discussions. And there are also other instruments where DSI discussions take, uh, take a very central role. So good luck uh, with the seminar. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Gaute. Uh, it seems that Simon has mm, problems in connecting, but uh, then we assume that you have uh, spoken then ba uh, basically for both the uh, Norwegian and also the South African side. Um, before we get actually now start of the substance, it would be good to know who actually uh, is um, attending the, the webinar. And uh, for that, uh, I would like to ask uh, my colleague Yannick um, to come up uh, with a quick um, query. So we have uh, prepared a quick query for, for the participants. Uh, it's uh, nothing which is confidential, but if you could then just uh, um, answer to the questions. Um, so from which region you're coming? Uh, which sector you are representing, and also um, um, on um, uh, the fora you are uh, potentially uh, observing um, that are related to, to digital sequence information that um, will help us, of course, to uh, shape um, the discussions and uh, also to have a good idea from whom the uh, questions will actually derive. Okay, so let's see that almost 75% have uh, have polled and okay, I think we can have a, maybe it's now a look at what is happening i um yanni could you exactly uh, display so no it's good to see that we do have a quite um equal representation of course uh, some that may be due to the time zone uh, um, some bias to western europe and others but all regions are um a part of the uh, the webinar which is good um, also good to see that um, there is uh, a um, good bunch of, in particular, government and governmental organizations, IPLCs are there, uh, academia, academia and private sector, so also here um, a, um, a representation of, of all with a um, majority of, of governmental um, participants and uh, uh, as assumed, um, the majority of participants following um, the CBD, uh, but very good to see that uh, also um, there are experts out there that are following the other 
um, for us, such as uh, UNCLOS, FAO, and WHO. And uh, for some 20, it seems to be new territory, but also for them, I think we will have um, good uh, and interesting news. Okay, so in, uh, with, with that, I would like to um, ask my colleague, Hartmut Meyer from the ABS Initiative um, to provide us uh, um, with an overview of uh, where we are in the different um, processes with respect to decisions and negotiations. Hartmut, you have the floor. Hartmut? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Zul. Um, yes, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay. Yeah, thank you and um, good afternoon and whatever time on the day you have to all our um, participants. Um, well, um, I'm going to um, inform about um, essentially um, a world um, and uh, we are very happy that we can resume our work on BSI and on further webinars and capacity development measures um, to um, work on the, the COP decisions of the CBD and also maybe contribute to the other fora. But um, very briefly, uh, as an introduction, because um, we assume that several of um, the participants are not, let's say, the, the general one, which followed a lot of our webinars, I'm going to introduce uh, the ABS Capacity Development Initiative as such. Um, um, it is uh, a multi-donor initiative um, hosted by the German government and implemented by the GIZ. German um, Development Agency and the ABS initiative is actually uh, now running um, since a pretty long time in the fifth phase. Um, we more or less followed the whole development of the Nagoya Protocol and are now working um, in its implementation. Um, you see a brief overview about countries in which we um, directly um, um, work on APS issues. And apart from the national um, interventions we are supporting, um, there is an emphasis also um, on the international discussion. So we um, are participating in the negotiations and we are like this webinar, um, have developed um, quite a lot of, um, of formats and, and events in the asset development um, area for DSI in the last three years. Next slide, please. Yeah. So this is um, um, a brief overview of what we did. I think I'm, I'm not going into detail here. Um, and the, there was already a question in the chat about um, sharing the slides. Yes, um, you, you will find the slides and um, also the recording of this webinar on our web page. So this is a brief overview. So I think the, the main, um, main parts also really um, um, supporting the negotiations were the two global DSI dialogues and the global DSI retreat, um, which the last one was just uh, happening before the Montreal session of the CBD. Please, next slide. So we just start with a brief overview um, of where we are coming from and um, what uh, has been um, reached until now. The, actually, the DSI um, discussion started 2016 in the CBD when the African group um, brought the issue on the negotiation table and asked uh, for benefit sharing um, solutions for the use of DSI, actually, so to um, apply uh, the principle of benefit sharing of the CBD also to uh, in the information on genetic resources to the immaterial world. Um, that uh, following the following two years um, where 
filled with some studies and other activities. And at the next COP in 2018, um, first negotiations on, on the substance started. Um, and um, it was um, decided that um, a further process um, has to um, um, has to follow after this COP and um, has to clarify how uh, DSI should be addressed in the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. That was um, a tough negotiation and I think a very um, good decision in the end, which then allowed um, a lot, a lot of um, capacity development measures worldwide uh, by several actors, including the ABS initiative. And it was, um, well, maybe also positive that the corona um, pandemic really stopped all negotiations and that gave us a lot of time to really go into a lot of details. And as you know, the COP15 then actually took a decision um, to establish a multilateral system for DSI benefit sharing until the next COP16 in 2024. But this is not the only forum, essentially, ESI is discussed in all international fora that deal with research and development and commercialization of uh, genetic resources uh, wherever they are and um, from viruses, whatever, to elephants and from areas out of uh, national jurisdiction to, of course, the territories of the countries. Um, in WIPO, um, we have, um, we can see a standard on DSI and patent applications um, that uh, might be a very useful um, standard to actually follow up um, where DSI is appearing in patents actually. Um, in the UNCLOS uh, Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction um, negotiations, an agreement on marine genetic resources and DSI benefit sharing was reached just recently. Um, um, also in the WHO, um, DSI is element of uh, the current negotiations of the pandemic treaty and also of other texts in the WHO. And um, the fora in the FAO, the International Plant Treaty and the Commission on Genetic Resources of Food and Agriculture were also discussing um, IT, but essentially um, there the negotiations after they stalled were not yet resumed. So next slide. In the following, I'm um, um, concentrating on those negotiations um, or those fora uh, which actually produce text. This is, as I said, the UNCLOS agreement um, and um, the CBD COP. Um, the WHO pandemic treaty will also be presented, but of course this is just uh, negotiate text under negotiations, so draft text. And what we can um, also announce is that in the FAO, there will be further work on DSI uh, until the 10th meeting of the next governing body in 2023. So then also there will, we will see a um, new round of DSI negotiations. What is the next slide? Uh, Tim, if, if that's okay for you, um, we uh, would then now jump to the panel. And um, I uh, would introduce you. I mean, you might be uh, known to, to many as uh, being professor of practice of uh, in Montreal at the McGill University and um, again, moderating um, a panel of, on um, DSI in uh, our webinars. And uh, now over to you to also maybe briefly uh, tell us um, with whom we may deal now uh, in the panel discussion. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Suel. It's a, a pleasure to be here and hello everyone. Um, I will be facilitating and uh, moderating uh, the um, forthcoming uh, panel discussion, which I think promises to be uh, both very informative and I trust will be uh, thought provoking as well. 
Um, this webinar, at least in my mind, to my knowledge, is unprecedented. We've never done anything quite as ambitious as this uh, across so many forums. And uh, it includes a, a really stellar cast of panelists who are well-known and widely recognized experts. For those of you who don't know me, I am a uh, professor of practice, as Sue I mentioned, at McGill University in Montreal at the Institute for the Study of International Development. My deep background is in diplomacy, and I've been involved in ABS, Access and Benefit Sharing, and DSI for many years across a number of form, forums. Um, Hartmut would have succinctly, um, in his final slide, uh, given us a snapshot um, where in the most active forums on DSI in the last year or two, a uh, good snapshot of the DSI landscape and the current state of the art, uh, state of play. Um, it wasn't meant to be comprehensive and it was meant to allow for, of course, our panelists um, to delve into a few more details in terms of uh, nuance, in terms of where uh, various forums are at regarding uh, DSI and um, and what, of course, ultimately we will be having the uh, panelists address is, um, you know, is the, are the prospects and, um, and the future landscape, what things might look like across, uh, within and across forums. As we are dealing with multiple forms, and we have, a, I think, quite a diverse uh, set of webinar registrants, as the poll indicates, um, I think I might spend a bit more time introducing our panelists than I uh, would uh, normally do. Um, so if I could ensure that we've got um, all the panelists' cameras on, let's have a look. Very good. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I will uh, introduce the panelists, starting with uh, Professor Margot Bagley. She's an Associate Dean of, for Research and a professor at Emory uh, University School of Law in Atlanta, Georgia, USA. She serves as friend of the chair in the Whitepool IGC on intellectual property, genetic resources, traditional knowledge, and folklore. Uh, Professor Bagley was a chemical engineer before moving into law and served on the first CBD OTEG on DSI, OTEG being an ad hoc technical expert group. Uh, she also was a uh, lead author on, uh, yes, two DSI related studies for the CBD Secretariat. And um, as many of you may know, she's provided expert assistance to the African group on DSI, genetic resources, and uh, patent issues. So welcome, um, a warm welcome to Margot. Next, we would like to introduce Danielle Kakoris. Danielle has held several roles at the interface between science, policy, and law. It's a very interesting, fascinating intersect. Um, for example, he has served as advisor to the permanent mission of the Republic of the Maldives on oceans, fisheries, and legal matters in the UN General Assembly and ANGA in 2013 and 2014. Between 2015 and 2020, the forthcoming five years, he served as Marine Species Officer at the CITES Secretariat, as many of you will know. Subsequently, he was Executive Director at Sea Shepherd Legal for two years. And more recently, Daniel worked towards the successful conclusion of the BBNJ Treaty as part of the High Seas Alliance, for which he co-led its work on MGRs on marine genetic resources. Since earlier this year, he consults several organizations on BBNJ, marine provisions, provisions of MEAs, multilateral environmental agreements, and fisheries matters. So a warm welcome to you as well, Daniel. Our third panelist is uh, Mr. Daniele Manzella. Uh, Mr. Benzella is a policy and legal expert with over 20 years of experience in the multilateral governance of food, agriculture, and the environment. He currently works at the Secretary of the Plant Treaty, the IT, at FAO. He served various other international organizations, both within and outside the UN system, such as the International Fund for Agricultural Development, the WWF, and the Global, Global Crop Diversity Trust. Earlier in his career, Danielle provided policy and legal assistance to more than uh, 40 developing countries regarding implementation of trade and environmental agreements. Danielle is an associate of the Center of Commercial Law at the University of Aberdeen. I should also note that he twice served uh, on the CBD's expert group on DSI at the CBD. So again, a warm welcome to you, Danielle. And last but not least, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Suri Boon. She is director of the Global Health Center and Professor of Practice for the Interdisciplinary Programs and International Relations slash Political Science at the Geneva Graduate Institute. Her work at the Institute is broadly concerned with the intersection of global governance and public health. She also directs the Knowledge Network on Innovation and Access to Medicines, a project that aims to maximize the contributions of research, 
and analysis to strengthening the pharmaceutical innovation system. Prior to joining the Graduate Institute in 2016, she was a lecturer, among other things, on global health at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And a warm welcome to you, Suri. So again, uh, welcome uh, to our panelists. I'm very pleased that you could join us to provide us with your uh, your very current knowledge, your deep expertise, um, and also your perspectives on, on, on the future regarding DSI in your forms and beyond. Uh, for everyone's benefit uh, on uh, in this uh, webinar this morning, I, or this afternoon, I would like to uh, underscore the point that the panelists are speaking in their individual expert capacity. So we will now move to um, four rounds of um, panelist interventions. Um, each proceeded with a question addressed to, um, to uh, all of our panelists. And as mentioned at the outset of the webinar, we will move after the fourth round to an open session uh, where we will be uh, welcoming um, from the chat, via the chat, uh, some questions and I'm sure observations and remarks from, from everyone participating in this uh, in this webinar. So let's begin uh, with the first round by uh, a couple of reminders uh, that the overall theme of this webinar in the context in which we're convening the panel is mapping out the prospects for a benefit sharing system for DSI within processes and perhaps I'm sure, in fact, more ambitiously spanning the different fora. This is a tall task as, as you can all imagine, but uh, one I know that our all of our four panelists are ready to take up. I'm reminded to all who have joined the, the webinar, um, this, as I mentioned, please do feel free to use the chat function to pose, to pose specific questions and comments, which of course everyone will see, and which will be directed by the team to the panelists in a dedicated uh, question and answer segment I mentioned following the fourth and final round of panelist interventions. I, again, I ask you to be as brief as possible uh, in terms of the questions and comments, and as obviously as polite as possible. A third point, which is directed to our panelists themselves, is please do limit your use of acronyms. I know I've already um, mm, I've not followed the rule, but please do, uh, if in fact you are going to use acronyms, which I'm sure you must, um, if you could just simply spell them out at, at, first, at first mention. So we'll start with a, an easy question, with a simple question, and it's the following. Who should share monetary benefits? And how could the system work nationally and internationally? So again, the question to the panelists is, who should share monetary benefits? And how could the system work nationally and internationally? Uh, the panelists, you have three minutes each, starting with Margot, followed by Daniele, Suri, and Danielle. Margot, you have the floor. Thanks, Jim. And thanks to the ABS Capacity Development Initiative for inviting me to participate on this webinar. Um, you say it's an easy question, Tim. I, I don't know. I think it's actually one of the most challenging uh, that we have because it relates to the trigger for benefit sharing. Mm. Um, and I will take a stab at it, it's something on which reasonable minds could differ. So my gut reaction is that those who benefit monetarily should share monetary benefits and benefit monetarily from DSI utilization. That seems fair. Um, but that would, of course, raise a question of who benefits monetarily. And with genetic resources, we tend to think or focus on utilization that results in commercialization. I think that's too narrow um, and probably results in undersharing of benefits as it doesn't collect from downstream beneficiaries or entities that impose negative externalities on biodiversity. We all probably benefit from DSI to some extent, and we all definitely benefit from conservation of biodiversity, particularly that engaged in by indigenous peoples and local communities, which I will later refer to as, as IPLCs. So for example, if a drug developed in part the utilization of DSI helped me be able to stay productive in my work so I continue to draw a paycheck, I have in a sense benefited monetarily. But at some point, the monetary benefit would seem too remote, too far removed from the use of DSI to justify monetary benefit sharing. Um, and I'm not trying to be facetious, but just to expand our thinking on, on who should share in light of our need to fund biodiversity conservation and incentivize that. Mm. Figuring out where to draw that line, that trigger between too remote and not too remote tends to lead to 
inefficiencies, high transaction costs, companies trying to keep their behavior on the side of the line that would not result in an obligation to share. And that raises the same kinds of inefficiencies, avoidance, undersharing of monetary benefits that we've seen for decades with bilateral and even some multilateral benefit sharing mechanisms. As such, I think a better approach, and my co-authors and I submitted a paper um, to the CBD Secretariat and the call for submissions, would be to say that countries should share monetary benefits on an aggregate basis, decoupled from access to DSI and taking into consideration as proposed by the African group, um, a country's level of development in setting the level of contribution or even exemption from contribution. Those countries could then collect, as you mentioned, national and international, they could collect funds from their domestic industries or users based on nationally defined criteria, perhaps focusing on certain industrial sectors, and they could choose to collect funds in a way that expands the contributor base to include not only direct commercial users, but also those whose negative externalities um, contribute to the erosion of biological diversity. This could also have the benefit of allowing for legal experimentation at the national level, which might allow best practices and approaches to develop. And I think also that users and non-parties should also be able to make contributions and share benefits. So that's that's my view on who should share benefits. Thanks, Margo. Uh, Daniele. Uh, thank you, Tim. And of course, uh, many thanks from my side as well to the ABS uh, uh, Capacity Development Initiative for organizing this webinar and a warm hello to all the other panelists and of course the attendees online. Um, Again, I'm essentially, I will just try to rephrase what what uh, Ma Margo has already, I think, very clearly explained and, and tried again to project this <clears throat> into the realm of the experience accumulated by the international treaty with its multilateral system of access and benefit sharing. Now, if we look at the historical sort of rationale of benefit sharing, we see that, the again, the uh, principle of benefit sharing aims to link Aim, aim, aimed and still aims to link directly or indirectly the value produced from the use of access to resource to compensation. <clears throat> and as such, the uh, conception of, of uh, ben, 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 benefit sharing is typically outcome-based and temporally structured. Uh, in such a way, the fair monetary re re returns accrue as compensation only after value is demonstrated. But uh, this is not the only option for benefit sharing by user. And in, again, if you look at the text of the standard material transfer um, um, uh, agreement of the international treaty, and also at the at the um, at the negotiations over the announcement of uh, of the si 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 system negotiations that um, are restarting this year. Uh, we see that an alternative benefit sharing scheme, the so-called subscription system, uh, was and uh, will still be considered. Uh, and in, in, under that scheme, essentially, we would we would collect upfront payments based on the overall revenue generated by crop sales. And of course, in both in both uh, uh, cases, the so-called single access system, where essentially benefits are uh, collected once value is generated and under the subscription system benefits uh, are contributed to a global common pool in which uh, funds support selected 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 projects aimed at increasing capacity in member countries of course in the overall uh, scope of the international treaty and its objectives linked to food security and sustainable agriculture so essentially um Although payments of monetary benefits is typically exposed by users occurring after revenues have been generated, ex-ante contributions can also be made. And of course, as Margo said, they can, they can be made by users, but they can also be made by member countries in the respective jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, now, payments for access, access to what? And, and of course, under one negotiating options uh, in the course of the announcement of the Matradela system, access would be to both genetic resources and to the information generated from the genetic resources. And again, in all, of course, in draft form, uh, we had uh, um, a recognition 
in the uh, SMTA that mandatory payments under the revised text of the SMTA would also reflect the sales of information generated from the material of the multilateral system that is commercialized. Now, how could the system work internationally and nationally? Um, well, uh, again, looking a little bit at the, at the at the negotiations over the announcement of the of the of the multilateral system. In the case of a system structured around or simply open to contribution by member countries and, of course, other institutional donors, the treaty negotiations highlighted the importance of early early pledges as a trust building mm -hmm. measure in the startup phase. So essentially contracting parties would be invited, contracting parties in a position to do so would be invited in the startup phase of the new system to make pledges into, um, into, this, into this global fund. Uh, you, um, what is the role of national institutions in implementing a multilateral benefit sharing solution that encompasses digital sequence inf information? Again, two rapid examples from the treaty negotiations on the reform of the multilateral system. Exemptions. Under a user-based user, user -based system, there were a number of exemptions uh, carved out. For instance, for small uh, breeding companies, for public sector uh, research uh, inst institutions, and for family farmers. And essentially, the role of national authorities would be to somehow certify these exemptions and, for instance, provide the governing body with a limited list of small breeding, uh, sm uh, small plant breeding companies. Second and final point. National actions would also be necessary to activate the allocation of uh, ben benefits. Uh, for instance, in the case of the inter 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 international treaty, it was discussed to uh, it was discussed to essentially draw up a list of possible criteria for the allocation of funds. Again, drawn from the from the from the from the from the global fund from the from the benefit sharing fund, they would take into account a number of actions. Uh, uh, performed at the national level, such as the ratification of um, an amended text um, of, the, uh, of the annex to the international treaty or, or, uh, or the sharing of material through the multilateral system or, or the ma making of material fully available under the rules of the multilateral system in order to access funding. Uh, over to you, Tim. Thanks very much, uh, Daniele. Uh, now, Suri, please. Thanks very much. First, let me thank the ABS Capacity Development Initiative for the invitation to be here. Uh, for those of us in the health sector, I think we have very few opportunities to have this kind of conversation. I really look forward to learning from, um, I think, what have been much longer standing debates in, in other arenas on, on these issues. Um, coming directly to your question, uh, Tim, on who should share monetary benefits, I think first it's important to point out that the scale of monetary benefits that we see in the health sector uh, can sometimes be enormous and, and, and dwarf some of the numbers I've seen elsewhere. And just as a brief reminder, um, Pfizer, for example, earned 56 billion uh, US dollars just in 2022 on its um, COVID-19 vaccines and, and, and drugs. Um, and this, of course, is much smaller than the total amount of global economic value that uh, that vaccination was projected to offer to the global economy, which the IMF estimated at nine trillion dollars if you could rapidly vaccinate the whole world, which is of course not not what happened. Um, but just to say the the amounts of uh, money at stake are enormous in in health. Um, and I think one of the distinctions that we see in the health sector compared to perhaps debates elsewhere is that we've been thinking less about monetary versus non-monetary and thinking more, I would say, about commercial versus non-commercial. So what, what do I mean by that? Sometimes the money matters and, and royalties or other kinds of financial contributions matter. And we've seen this in the negotiation of the pandemic influenza preparedness framework, um, which does not yet include uh, digital sequence information. Uh, perhaps we'll, we'll get there uh, one day, but um, focuses more on, on physical samples. But in that framework, the key uh, product of interest is, uh, or the key benefit of interest, I should say, is products, is access to vaccines and drugs and diagnostics, which are uh, oftentimes commercial products. So that's oftentimes considered more important for public health, more important for other economic uh, reasons than the money that may flow, for example, from royalties um, themselves. However, 
when we think again about this influenza framework, it is financed in part by uh, company financial contributions. Companies essentially uh, pay to play, as we call it, or pay kind of a uh, an upfront um, participation fee that ensures that they will get access to um, uh, uh, influenza virus, a pandemic potential in the event of of a potential um, crisis. And so this amount of money has been very important coming from, from the pharmaceutical industry. It has essentially allowed the, the entire system to function. Uh, so, so this is, um, I think, certainly an important source of benefits, but, but I would argue for thinking beyond uh, monetary to um, commercial more broadly. And in health, I think it's very clear who is generating um, uh, commercial benefits. It's usually private companies that are developing drugs, diagnostics, and uh, vaccines using DSI, um, uh, and it's primarily companies who have been paying into the influenza framework. This could be channeled through governments, uh, through uh, countries, as, as some have argued, but for the moment, what we've seen working well for influenza is directly from companies um, prior to the benefit being realized and after the benefit being realized. Thanks very much, uh, Suri. Um, this is, um, <laughs> I'm finding this extremely informative and I thought I knew a lot about uh, DSI and, and um, resources. Uh, Daniel, please. Thanks, Tim. And also thanks for me to the ABS Capacity Development Initiative for inviting me to be a part of this panel. Um, rather than presenting you my own view, I will, as we've seen in the survey, um, not everyone might be aware of the very recent agreement on BB&J, so I will, in my responses, sort of provide you a bit of an overview of what was discussed and what was agreed in the BB&J context. And let me start off by acknowledging just how much of a breakthrough it was to actually get monetary benefit sharing provisions for marine genetic resources and digital sequence information into that text. Uh, it took about 20 years to get to a BB&J agreement from the first discussions, five of those in negotiation mode, and it took until the day after the last day of the second um, overtime negotiation to actually resolve the benefit sharing provisions and in particular how to include DSI. Um, and so the text is a very carefully balanced compromise in that regard. And then with that context, what's actually in the text? In terms of the question, who will share monetary benefits under BB&J, there's currently two phases in the text. Um, the compromise was that initially, after the treaty enters into force, developed state parties will share monetary benefit sharing, uh, will share monetary benefits in the form of flat rate payments. Um, and their level will not directly be coupled to the value of commercialized MGRs and DSI from those countries, but instead it will be sort of scaled based on the assessed contributions those countries are already contributing to the core budget. The BBNJ COP will then review and assess these monetary benefit sharing provisions every two years, and the first review shall take place no later than five years after the entry into force of the agreement. And the COP can then decide on other modalities for the future. And this may include both changing the types of payments, and it provides a few examples. So, for example, milestone payments or payments of percentages of the revenue from sales of products. Um, there is also a tiered option that is uh, that could be similar to what Margo just proposed uh, or um, explained as a as a proposal. Um, and these future modalities may also change which state parties will have to share the monetary benefits. Um, those monetary benefits are then paid into a special fund that will finance capacity building and implementation assistance activities. The text also establishes a special body, the Access and Benefit Sharing Committee, to review the implementation of these provisions. And now, sort of moving on to the national side of that question, um, the BBNJ text focuses on the obligation to the state, and the state shall take the necessary legislative, administrative, or policy measures to ensure that benefits are shared in accordance with the treaty, but it leaves the specifics relatively open. The only slight exception is that the text also establishes a notification system that goes into a bit more detail um, and that establishes a pre-cruise, post-cruise and utilization notification um, that will provide information on, on the basis of which the whole system will be operated. Thank you. 
Uh, thanks very much, uh, Danielle, and uh, oh, big congratulations uh, to you and to all the others for a, a tremendous uh, effort uh, early this, this year. I had the opportunity to be involved in the early days on BBNJ, and I, I have to say that you know I, I left the last round that I was involved in in New York thinking this will never conclude. So uh, congratulations. It just shows you what is possible. Um, before we move to the second round, I just just one remark. I mean, I think one of the challenges at least I have as an observer, uh, let alone uh, as if I were an active uh, participant in in one or, or more than one of the forums you've been involved in, is to know what's going on in parallel forums. And not just that, I mean, that's the first tranche of difficulty. The next one is to somehow, and we will get to that eventually uh, in this panel, is to see if, we, if there can be some cross fertilization and not necessarily looking for uniformity or you know one size fits all, or there's like one answer. In my experience in multilateral affairs, that's, that, that's not the case. Uh, there's something, diversity is good actually, um, but the what challenge is how we can learn from one another in terms of you know what the current thinking is, what some of the models might be. Some, some might work in, in one form, maybe not another, but I think there could be some more active learning. Uh, but I think that doesn't take place unless um, there's a conscious effort for that to occur. And that's going to be a big challenge, but I think it's actually essential because we're dealing with such complexity and some overlap as well. So uh, to the second round. Uh, the question for the panelists is, um, uh, uh, quite fittingly, uh, is uh, related to non-monetary benefits. The focus of the discussions I've mostly been involved in um, have been really predominantly about monetary benefits. But there are, as we know, long lists of non-monetary benefits associated with ABS and DSI. Um, at first glance, the following question may strike some watching the seminar, uh, excuse me, the webinar as really simplistic and, and maybe obvious. But I think there's a divergence of understanding and views across and amongst uh, within forums. So let's hear what the panelists have to say. The question is, how to best deal with non-monetary benefits in a multilateral system? We've already heard from some of you on this. Uh, and who should be the recipients of such benefits? So again, the question, how to best deal with non-monetary benefits in a multilateral system, and who should be the recipients of such benefits? So we've got three minutes each, please, uh, starting with Daniele, followed by Suri, Daniel, and Margot. Daniele, you, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Tim. Uh, let me give you a straightforward answer. Um, multilateral funding should specifically target non-monetary benefit sharing mechanisms. Uh, we know that these mechanisms, uh, information sh exchange, uh, technology transfer, and capacity building, again, in the wording of the international treaty, currently suffer from a shortage of uh, re re resources, uh, although they are essential to meet both public value and equity challenges. So using the monetary benefit sharing mechanism to help realizing the non-monetary mechanisms may actually improve the overall functioning of the system. And I think it would also initiate uh, or somehow strengthen a positive feedback loop uh, as, of course, improvement of, again, information exchange, technology transfer, and capacity building would, in turn, enhance access use and the generation of benefits. So essentially, financial mechanisms can specifically deliver or stimulate the delivery of non-monetary benefit sharing. Now, the experience accumulated with the, with the benefit sharing fund of the International Treaty, uh, in my opinion, offers some insights on challenges and opportunities associated with non-monetary benefit sharing. But I think a first point uh, should be made in this regard, that the treaty and its multilateral system essentially conceive benefits of collective nature and generated at the global level. And as such, renationalizing or re-individualizing benefits requires careful mediation. And within the treaty, this mediation, and again, I'm looking at the experience with the Benefit Sharing Fund, occurs by addressing two fundamental challenges that I think also might be of general relevance to other instruments. Uh, the, the first is the public value challenge. So essentially how to ensure that the, the impacts of investments of non-monetary benefit sharing beyond the actors of the sectors in which the funded activities are carried out. And uh, again, the BSF aims, the benefit sharing fund aims to play a role in generative incentives to, uh, for actors and countries to essentially cooperate 
for the provision of collective benefits that can or are best realized, that can be or are best realized at the global level. The second challenge that is actually it's quite re 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 related to the public value challenge is the cooperation challenge. Uh, funds should be directed towards the strengthening of coordination and cooperation between stakeholders, activities, and countries, again, for the delivery of non-monetary benefit sharing in order to address the uh, various existing interdependencies that, that are particularly pronounced in the area of plant genetic resources for food and agriculture. Who should be the recipients? A very clear uh, orientation in the text of the international treaty, the benefits arising from the use of plant genetic resources that are shared under the multilateral system should primarily flow to farmers in all countries, especially in developing countries and countries with economies in transitions. Now, general uh, orientation given by the text of the international treaty, one lesson learned from, again, from the treaty experience. Uh, Again, I've talked about the collective nature of uh, ben, 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 ben benefits and how multilateral funding can actually stimulate the, uh, the delivery of such collective benefits. But we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that the emphasis on the global and collective character uh, uh, should not lose sight of the fact that the actual provision of benefits and the way they are, they are perceived are ultimately rooted in the domain of the local, of course, in specific activities at the national and local levels. And we all know that a lack of capacity to engage in global and collective actions essentially undermines the possibility for governments, organizations, and individuals to take advantage of the benefits generated at the global level. So in conclusion, I think there's a careful uh, equilibrium that needs to be that needs to be stricken uh, between global activities and specific actions, actors on, or countries. Over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Daniele. Uh, Suri, please. Thanks. Um, let me pick up on, on uh, the thread I was raising before, which is the emphasis on products, on, on vaccines and drugs and diagnostics. Um, which are indeed often considered the most important um, benefits flowing from DSI or samples shared in, in the context of disease outbreaks, uh, which is where most of the, the emphasis has been. And here, again, looking at the example from the influenza framework, we have an agreement that companies will supply, for example, 10% of their uh, vaccine production globally to WHO. Uh, in the event of a pandemic, out, uh, uh, influenza pandemic, and that WHO would then decide, you know, where to to um, send those vaccines or or other products. And uh, one of the ethical frameworks that was developed during COVID nineteen is, you know, how should we actually think about uh, who should get priority in in, in a crisis? Uh, and in, for for COVID nineteen, the priority was really put on the most vulnerable within every country. It was clear that this was a, a virus that was spreading very quickly, so that made sense. But you can imagine a slightly different scenario, uh, such as an Ebola outbreak, where uh, indeed you have the most vulnerable who are very close to the outbreak itself. But there's a, a second consideration, which which is how do you actually stop the outbreak um, from spreading further? And this is where, of course, it makes perfect sense to send vaccines to do what we call ring vaccination. You vaccinate around an outbreak, and hopefully that's one way of kind of putting out the fire, um, so to speak. So I, I, I share these just because I think it gives you a bit of the flavor of how we've been thinking about um, who should get access uh, to these benefits and who should decide, um, and that there's been a big emphasis on trying to identify uh, multilateral solutions that rely very heavily on the work of uh, organizations like, um, like WHO. Um, there is also, of course, a, a very important collective benefit, as Daniele was just highlighting, when we think about surveillance. So it's not just products, but also the informational benefit of the rapid and widespread sharing of DSI uh, on pathogens. And many of you now know very well your Greek alphabet and letters like Delta and Omicron, because we've all been following very obsessively for the last few years different variants of COVID-19. Um, this is a, a classic non-monetary benefit that, that really does indeed benefit everybody in the world. If, if uh, governments and scientists can track the emergence of a variants, the evolution of viruses, um, it's a kind of benefit that doesn't make sense to allocate or to, to limit in any way. Um, 
and I would argue it's also very much a non-commercial benefit. It's one that I think we don't want to necessarily uh, attach payments to. Um, but there, there's another kind of non-monetary benefit, and this is the last point I want to raise, uh, that is very, very important in the health sector. And, and those are the non-monetary benefits that flow back to the researchers themselves, those who are generating the uh, DSI, so academic researchers or people sitting in labs. And for this group of stakeholders, what is super important is often academic credit, right? Authorship on papers, participation in research collaborations, opportunities for training, um, uh, et cetera. And I think here, it is very important that we identify and track and encourage that kind of benefit sharing. Um, I don't think we have very good systems to do so yet at the international level in, in health, but it's certainly something that could be envisioned. Um, and, and I'd be very keen to hear if this has been uh, successfully tackled in other sectors. Thanks very much, Turi. Uh, I'm sure uh, someone will address your last uh, question. Um, fascinating. Um, uh, Danielle, I believe you're next. Thanks, Tim. So again, going to the BB&J text, there's two places that directly address non-monetary benefit sharing um, relevant to DSI. And one is in the actual uh, marine genetic resources section of the text, but then there's also a, a separate, more general part on capacity building and technology transfer. Um, in the MJR section, the non-monetary benefits listed include, for example, access to DSI, uh, in general, open access to findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable scientific data, FAIR. Um, there's transfer of marine technology, um, there's capacity building, which specifically includes financing of research programs um, and increased in technical and scientific cooperation. Many of these are qualified, for example, according to current international practice or in accordance with other parts of the agreement. So there's a bit more detail to it. Um, Another element that's worthwhile highlighting is that it also includes open access to the information from the notification system that I explained earlier. And some of them may be argued to constitute non-monetary benefit uh, by themselves. So for example, the pre-cruise notification will include opportunities for scientists, in particular from developing countries to be involved in the project. The post-cruise notification will, for example, include information on where DSI is deposited and attach a standard BB&J batch identifier to be able to follow that information through the chain of custody. The COP also has the power to establish new forms of benefit sharing down the line. And in terms of the question of who receives that, most of the uh, non-monetary benefit sharing provisions can a priori benefit all state parties. But there's usually an in particular developing countries in the relevant paragraphs, and in particular the ones about capacity building. And then sort of moving further along that line in the capacity building section, it's much more focused. There's a clear um, objective specified that it's supporting developing countries, in particular those in special situations through capacity building and technology transfer to implement the relevant parts of the provisions. Um, there is a list of types of capacity building. I won't go into detail here. Um, but I think what's important to mention is that, again, the treaty establishes a specific body to monitor, review, and provide continuous um, guidance on the implementation of the provisions. So there's a lot going on. And one of the ways that parties can keep track of it is that there will be a clearinghouse mechanism as a central open access platform to provide and disseminate information but it also includes among its functions, the matching of capacity building needs with support available. Um, there's a bit of a discussion as to, will this just be a static website or will the, there be a person behind it? And the COP will decide on those modalities going forward. Um, now, sort of departing a bit from the text, going a bit more general, and that's the last point I'm gonna make is, you asked how, how to best deal with non-monetary benefits in the multilateral system. And I think it's worth highlighting that um, the BBNJ Treaty enshrines a country-driven, transparent, effective, and iterative process, and it, and it establishes dedicated committees to keep track of these processes to ensure that they don't become neglected down the line. Hmm. Um, both of them also have uh, provisions to make sure that developing countries, in particular developing countries in special situations, are represented and have a voice at the table. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Danielle. Um, Margot. 
Thanks. Um, so what is helpful to my mind about creating a multilateral mechanism in addition to a fund is that it makes space for creative and sustained, importantly, non-monetary non benefit sharing to contribute to capacity building, um, among other things. So I could envision a mechanism with a common goal, but multiple moving parts, including the monetary fund, but a plethora of structures to facilitate um, and record metrics related thereto, different kinds of non-monetary benefit sharing options by various actors. I think non-monetary benefit sharing is a particularly appropriate way for academic researchers and other users whose work may not result in or directly lead to a commercial product to contribute to benefit sharing. And there is so much that such users can provide to IPLCs and other providers, including educational knowledge transfer, technical capacity building equipment, infrastructure, and more. But what we've seen so far with existing ABS systems is non-monetary benefit sharing tends to be fairly ad hoc. It often lacks longevity, consistency, not sustained, and that is not necessarily very helpful. Um, and it also lacks metrics for evaluating success. Um, Danielle mentioned a clearinghouse, which I think is, is definitely a useful tool and which I think it would really be helpful to incorporate because um, those allow for transparency and accountability. Um, and that would, I think, also contribute to the possibility of standardization and the development of best practices, as well as um, helping people to see the wide variety of non-monetary benefit sharing that is taking place and like, oh, perhaps we could try this and that. And as well as not just starting something and stopping and, and leaving people hanging as it were. In terms of who should be the recipients, I think there should be multiple recipients for both monetary and non-monetary benefits, including IPLCs and local community members who steward 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity, as well as researchers, environmentalists, and citizens of member state governments, particularly in low and middle income countries who are tasked with ensuring the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. But one of the great things about non-monetary benefit sharing, at least particular types of it, is it also benefits those who are sharing, um, especially if you're engaged in knowledge transfer um, activities, because it's not just one way. There's going to be um, virtuous building upon the knowledge that you're sharing as you're learning from others. Um, and, and that also leads to, I think, a greater valuation of the contributions that IPLCs and others, perhaps in lower income countries, are actually providing. So that's, that's another benefit. So I think the non-monetary benefit aspect of this mechanism is really important, and I hope to see it built out really well. Thank you very much, Margo. Thank you, everyone. Um, some really um, interesting avenues we could could go down. Um, it, uh, but interestingly, um, you know, emphasis by a number of you on um, learning, um, uh, incremental approaches, maybe iterative approaches, and uh, and innovation, as Danielle, for example, um, indicated. Uh, there's been some of that in uh, BBNJ uh, in the final uh, final text, which I gather has actually hasn't. I've been cleaned yet uh, from in a legal sense, but I'm sure that will happen happen soon. Um, capacity building, capacity development uh, mentioned by a number of the panelists, and that actually cues up the next uh, the next question for you all. I see that we're pretty much on time, so let's continue to uh, to work a pace. Um, the question, uh, this particular question, uh, has long bothered me, at least the lack of an answer to the question, and I've got. Fair amount of experience uh, working in the UN, UN system across a good number of forms, um, and I think this area is is really less has been less treated and certainly under researched, and I would even argue maybe sort of a dormant subject on, on from sustainable development perspective, and that's the link between uh, capacity development or building science and technology and international development. Uh, this is an area that I think, as I said, has been under researched and um, under. Um, 
underestimated as as well. But I think we could see, for example, at uh, BBNJ, uh, the IT, uh, from what I've heard now, WHO, and certainly C CBD, that I think this situation is actually turning around. But let's hear from the panelists. So the question, the third question is, how can DSI benefit sharing be linked to capacity development in research and development, R&D, and international cooperation? Again, more slowly, how can DSI benefit sharing be linked to capacity development in research and development and international cooperation? So again, you've got three minutes each, and we'll start with uh, Suri, uh, followed by Daniel, Margot, and Daniele. Suri, please. Thanks very much. Um, indeed, capacity building and international cooperation are definitely a, a major concern and ongoing negotiations in the, the WHO pandemic treaty process. And since we unfortunately missed part of the, the slide presentation from Hartmut earlier on the webinar, let me also take this opportunity to mention there's a parallel negotiation in the health sector, which is the amendment of the international health regulations, the set of rules that preceded COVID-19 um, and that, that indu indeed precede the pandemic, um, the proposed pandemic treaty, I should say. We don't have a pandemic treaty yet. Uh, and I flag this because I think uh, it's important to highlight the complexity of the ongoing processes, how important um, ABS is in both of these parallel processes, and the question of how can we best address the capacity building issues have come up again in, in both processes. Um, in the international health regulations, the capacity of countries to uh, detect, prevent, detect, and respond to outbreaks is already really at the core. Um, and it's increasingly recognized that the ability of countries to, for example, detect pathogens to generate um, uh, DSI, or what we call in the health sector genomic sequencing data, um, since I see nomenclature is a key a point of interest among the participants here. Um, but the ability of countries to actually generate that data is very much of concern, and it's of concern not just to the country itself, but to the global community, because if we want good surveillance, you want every country to be able to um, sequence uh, um, the genomes of pathogens and, sh and be willing to share that information quickly. And again, we saw the importance of that during the, um, the last three, uh, three plus years. I think the good news is that we have seen a very dramatic increase in such capacities. And so sometimes people uh, may, may uh, worry uh, about what are the outcomes of all these capacity building programs. And we've seen a very, very rapid increases in DSI generation capacity across all countries um, over the last three years. Um, and that uh, it's not just generating and sharing DSI, but also analyzing. And we hear oftentimes from countries, we want to not only be able to share it with others, but to analyze and use that data. And ultimately, as you flagged, uh, Tim, to use it to develop drugs and vaccines and diagnostics domestically in, in, in the case of many countries, perhaps not all, but, but many, many different countries. Um, so I think that some of the ongoing discussions around uh, not only obligations to share, but obligations to finance um, capacity building are key to ensuring that this actually happens. Um, and indeed, international collaborations that do build capacities are often seen as a benefit, as I mentioned a few minutes ago. But I think there's also a, a virtuous circle that we can see, which is that when you have strong international scientific collaborations, you have trust built between researchers, the willingness to share to share quickly um, uh, increases. And, and, and this is what we've learned through our own research. Uh, and this is indeed how some of the very first sequences um, were shared by Chinese researchers in January of 2020, when COVID-19 first um, began to spread internationally. Over. Thank you very much, Suri. Uh, Daniel, please. Thank you, Tim. Um, you will see that I've, I've covered some of the links already in my previous presentation. I will try to avoid duplication here, so it might be a slightly shorter answer. Um, so again, the, the BBJ text links uh, benefit sharing to capacity building already directly in multiple ways. Um, as mentioned before, the monetary benefit sharing uh, for MGRs and DSI is not directly shared with countries, but instead it goes into a special fund that foresees a narrow range of activities um, and all of them are directly related to accomplishing the objective that, of the treaty as a whole. Uh, and they include funding capacity building, including training related to the transfer of marine technology, assist developing state parties to implement the agreement more generally and support conservation and sustainable use programs by indigenous people and local communities. Um, 
and all of them to a certain degree speak to the link between capacity building and research and development. But um, this gets even more specific when you look at the objectives of the marine genetic resource section, which explicitly include the generation of knowledge, scientific understanding and techno technological innovation in the treaty itself and the development and transfer of marine technology. Um, and then several of the non-monetary benefits that I just shared in my previous intervention directly support that objective. For example, ensuring that the data um, is shared and the obligation uh, to states to make sure they are um, uh, accessible. Um, also, the financing of research programs as a part of uh, capacity building, um, explicitly mentioning that, and in general, um, the obligations for states to increase technical and scientific cooperation. Um, it's also worth noting that the types of capacity building specified in the capacity building and technology section explicitly includes things like strengthening institutional capacity, improving infrastructure, and again, explicitly research programs. The fact that there will be dedicated committees to oversee this work is another opportunity to make sure that um, needs are reflected. Um, and maybe just one thing, uh, a part of the BVNJ text, it's also worthwhile noting that there's currently the ocean decade um, going on from 2021 to 2030, which even with the treaty currently not yet being into force, can provide some initial impetus towards improving um, innovation and science uh, with regards to the future implementation of the treaty. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Danielle. Uh, Margo, please. Thanks. So, excuse me. Um, the question, how can DSI benefit sharing be linked to capacity development and you know, being international cooperation? I think they're both monetary and non-monetary benefit sharing. So DSI utilization creates the opportunity, I'm sorry, creates the obligation to share benefits. And the multilateral mechanism should tell folks or give how to share benefits and give opportunities, a plethora of opportunities, I think, short and long term, um, to partner with um, disadvantaged groups in building capacity. And there are lots of different ways that you can do that. I remember, um, and I, I don't think I'll ever forget, attending a side event at, I believe it was COP12 in Pyeongchang, South Korea, and hearing an IPLC member from a Latin American country say that her group wasn't looking for a lot of money. She's like, just build us a school. And I thought that was so profound because she realized that when you build a school, when you educate children, you change the trajectory, or at least you potentially change the trajectory if you do it well, of a generation. And you create capacity building from the ground up. Um, and in a way that just throwing money at a problem might, might not do. So that is, um, I think, along the lines of what we should be considering. I think we need to um, dramatically increase the capacity of researchers in low and middle income countries to use DSI effectively. Um, and one of the projects that I'm working on now, totally separate from this, is enhancing innovator diversity in the patent system, particularly focused on the United States and the fact that women and underrepresented minorities um, patent at a much lower rate um, than you would expect. And one of the downsides of that is that there are studies showing that women are more likely to invent solutions for problems that women face, including health problems. And I saw when doing um, commercialization education on the African continent, that African researchers very often are more likely to develop solutions to African problems. And so if the capacity isn't there, then there are a lot of problems that are not going to be addressed because the people best positioned to know what they are are not going to have the tools to do that. And so capacity development through monetary, non-monetary benefit sharing is going to be important and I think helpful um, in biodiversity conservation, but beyond in, in many different ways. And, and I, I'd like to think broadly about the benefits that, that we can see there. Thanks very much, Margot. Uh, Danielle, please. 
Thank you, Tim. Um, well, my, my answer to this question would be the following. I think it would be fundamental at this, at this juncture, if we're really looking at, 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 a, at DSI benefit sharing linked to capacity development in the area of genomics research and innovation. I think it's essential to avoid an incomplete approach to capacity. Uh, capacity, I think, in this area is, I think, should be understood uh, not only as the ability to access genomic data and, of course, to use genomic data as well, but also as capacity to contribute and use metadata and other types of relevant data, uh, capacity to participate in the building of the standards and, on, and uh, ontologies that underlie the so-called digital commons, and ultimately also the capacity to participate in the governance of the digital commons. If we follow an incomplete approach to capacity uh, that, for instance, looks just as the ability to access genomic, uh, genomic data, the uh, recurrent demands for reciprocity, uh, for knowledge and re 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 resource would ultimately result in barriers to collaboration and exchange, uh, which is which of course has been also a, a very uh, sort of voice concerned by the by the uh, scientific community when looking at access and benefit sharing. So I think a more holistic approach to a capacity development in this area, um, my opinion should target the following issue. What different capacity modalities can be established and sustained over time to maximize research engagement and co-production of innovation? And I think Margo has already alluded to this. Uh, ultimately, the uh, diverse uh, individuals, communities, organizations, institutions, networks, uh, each may offer certain kinds of capacity in research and development, while, of course, lacking other kinds of capacity. And I think in the, the, the in integration of all these capacities, and of course, with an emphasis on the value of human capital development over a narrower focus on the development of one product or uh, te 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 technology, I think is particularly necessary to effectively reconcile different logics and tensions, and of course, to overcome the well-known structural inequities that that uh, that appear in the process of science and in the, in the, in innovation. Now, uh, looking at inter international cooperation, uh, we know that uh, viable access to data for uh, research and in, in, in innovation depends not only on being part of the research process, not only on determining permissions, uh, protocols for sharing the, 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 the data, but also, of course, on infrastructure and human capital development. So essentially to orient international cooperation in this area, I think it would be important to get a better sense of the infrastructures needed for conducting research and for, for conducting uh, uh, cooperative research and development, of course, in the area of uh, genomics. So, I'll, and I'll finish with this with this uh, with this note. We, the, at the international treaty, we commissioned a study back in 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 uh, in 2017. And remember that Margot was also part of, part of the study, looking at the at the same bio, the synthetic biology landscape. And I think the 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 authors of the of the study interviewed sampled a significant number of uh, genomics uh, re re researchers in various sectors, by the way, and essentially asked the question about the needed infrastructure uh, for conducting again uh, cooperative research uh, and development. And views, and I think from views, I think options also for international corporations were different. Uh, some uh, perceive that high cost infrastructure is required, that significant investment in hard infrastructure, building uh, uh, microbiology labs, uh, other fixed equipment is necessary and essentially uh, uh, the, the, Again, simply being able to sequence a sample of access to, uh, to sequence data would not be enough to produce, to produce significant value. And the production of this significant value is linked to high investment in infra, 
infrastructure. Others uh, were more in favor of a low cost infrastructure model whereby uh, genomics research and innovation could also be conceived as a relatively low barrier accessible field for researchers and students, of course, including in developing countries with uh, and and that the infrastructure needs may also be low in some cases and relatively non-reliant on hard infra, infra, infrastructure. A third perspective that could be embraced is the one of flexible infrastructure that would actually integrate both low and high cost and high and, and high cost pers, uh, pers, 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 perspectives. And in these cases. Uh, infrastructure needs would be flexible and depend on the actual research objectives. Uh, so essentially, it's also possible for international cooperation in this area to pursue a research and education ap ap approach, where low cost and high cost infrastructure are ultimately two ends of a, a, a continuum, and in some cases, bottom up approaches that simply incentivize students and re re researchers with little access to formal training would be preferred because they could engage in exploration, teamwork, and innovation. And in some other cases, high cost investment is necessary to foster fundamental work and sustain scientific advance. So again, there are a number of option, uh, options, I think, for international cooperation, I think, in this area. Over to you, Tim. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Daniele, and thank you, everyone. Um, it's um, very much tempting to <laughs> to take the floor and offer some um, some some remarks. Uh, uh, maybe we will have time for that later. I do see that the the chat um, interest is building, um, and we would I'm quite anxious to get to uh, to the um, to the open question and answers. Um, and I but I do see a lot of um, congruence uh, in 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 concerns and also in in approaches. Um, and which I think uh, really does bode well for uh, for six for real success for actual implementation on the ground, which is something of very strong interest to all of you, obviously, but also to to me as well. So let's move to the fourth and final round. Um, <clears throat> in this last question, uh, well, Margot, um, you thought the first question wasn't so simple. Well, this last one, I, even I have to acknowledge, it's not that um, straight straightforward. And it's probably the most um, challenging and uh, certainly the most visionary of the four questions we've asked you to address. In some ways, it's actually the uh, what I could, would call the elephant in the multilateral multilateral room. Um, I lecture on global governance. And based on my experience in uh, multilaterally, uh, both at the regional and global level, um, and also working in a Western-based bureaucracy, uh, I find the world of global policy making and decision making like really extremely siloed. Um, this won't surprise you. I, I think most people would concur with uh, that observation. Um, but the irony is um, that that this is the, the, the siloed, this separation of uh, ministries within governments and of course uh, internationally, but in terms of institutions, um, really run in the face of war, the nature of uh, current global challenges. Um, that really argue strongly for, in my mind, um, to be tackled in a in an interconnected way, um, and 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 actually uh, strongly advocate collaboration coordination. Um, so that's a that's a real challenge, and that's particularly um, salient in terms of this final question, uh, which is the big one, the crucial one, and, and that is, um, do you have a vision for a truly global multilateral DSI benefit sharing system? And if you do have one. Uh, could you briefly outline it and address the question of how such a system can attain multiple policy objectives? So it's a big question. Do you have a vision for a truly global multilateral DSI benefit sharing system? And if so, uh, uh, what would it look like? And, and if you could address the question of how that system could actually uh, meet more than one policy objective, um, that would be um, extremely welcome. We'll start with you, Danielle. Thank you, Tim. Um, and I'm I'm somewhat fortunate that I can refer a little bit to the to the vision of member states as it is reflected in the treaty. Um, so that's a bit of an uh, get out of jail free card. Um, I know that there's some member states in the um, in the participants, um, and uh, they they may might also share some of their views during the discussion, of course. But um, just some initial reflections on how. The BBJ benefit sharing provisions 
fit together sort of with a more global approach. Um, and, and as Haute already mentioned in the, in the introduction, um, when CBD COP uh, concluded its decision on the benefit sharing of DSIs in December 2022, um, congratulations to all of you involved as well. Um, that question, of course, was very present in the room for every discussion in BB&J afterwards in the lead up to the final negotiation round and also during the final negotiation round. And on the one hand, states express an appetite to build on the principles that were reached in that decision, not to create incompatible systems. Um, scientists and technical advisors stress that scientific practice currently does not differentiate between different sources of DSI. They were using the same databases. Currently, less than 1% of sequences are from uh, national uh, areas beyond national jurisdiction. And there were concerns that the type of notification system needed to implement some of the ideas that initially were on the table for BBNJ could disincentivize the use of DSI from ABNJ towards um, uh, DSI from national jurisdictions. On the other hand, I think it's important to acknowledge that there are different starting points for the discussion. In CBD, the jurisdictional question was clear. Um, the DSI is, was under national jurisdiction, while in the BBNJ context, it was much trickier with some of the delegations of the view that MGRs and DSI from areas beyond national jurisdiction would fall under freedom of the high seas and others arguing that it would fall under common heritage of mankind. Um, and that discussion on those principles was literally the last issue to be solved in the entire negotiations. Um, and so the text therefore represents a hard one and careful balance. And I am hope I'm not straying too much from an expert perspective by predicting that many delegations and stakeholders will want to move with great care not to upset that balance going forward. Luckily, um, for the prospects of moving towards a global system, the negotiators did provide some touch points in the text. Um, and the, first of all, it, uh, the text specifies that the agreement shall be interpreted and applied in a manner that does not undermine relevant other agreements. And it also requires parties to BB&J to promote the objectives of the agreement and cooperation to achieve them under other relevant bodies that they are party to. There's also a specific process in which BB&J could adopt a mechanism adopted under CBD. Um, you will recall from my earlier intervention that the monetary benefit sharing provisions currently in the text will be reviewed biannually. Um, and the first of that re those reviews will uh, take place no later than five years after the entry into force. And the COP can then adopt other modalities for benefit sharing. And in doing so, the text specifies specifically that the COP should be mutually supportive and adaptable to other access and benefit sharing mechanisms which is a clear link to the DSI dis discussion under CBD. And, and sort of it will end up with a decision, does BB&J after that time go with the CBD model or does it stick with its own model? And that's a real opportunity to align the two systems. Cheers. Cheers, thanks, uh, Daniel. Uh, Marco, please. So um, this, in, in a way, is an easier question than the first one because it's a vision. <laughs> um, and and I just like to start by saying sometimes I'm I'm approached um, by people. Um, it's happened at parties who, when they find out I'm a patent attorney, they're like, "Ooh, I have this idea for an invention," um, and they tell me what the idea is, and I I ask them, "Well, do you know how to make it?" They're like, "No." I'm like then you don't have an invention because you've got to be able to make it and instruct others, enable others to make it and use it. And so that's kind of where I am with this vision. I have a vision, but don't quite know how to accomplish it. But um, there are elements that I, that I can share. First, so I think it's important to keep in mind that developments in machine learning um, portend a future where we may no longer even need access to sequence information. We're starting to see that because of the predictive power of AI. So tying the system to requiring labeling of DSI, as some folks have proposed, um, for benefit sharing purposes as opposed to taxonomic purposes, is not only inconsistent with the way DSI is used now, but also with where we're heading in the future. So with that in mind, 
I envision a single multilateral mechanism that would be effective across all of the different fora where DSI benefit sharing is being discussed. It would have a variety of non-monetary benefit sharing programs, short, medium, long-term clearinghouse with accountability standards and metrics built in and crafted to be sustainable and regenerative, involving people and knowledge transfers both ways, infrastructure development, equipment, and more, along with a robust and well-endowed monetary fund that distributes monies through various streams, um, such as for competitive-based projects, for conservation support, for IPLCs as primary custodians of biodiversity to incentivize them to continue their efforts. Um, and doing this with transparency and um, a fund that's easy to use in terms of contributing to and, and receiving money from. The system would allow in some way for recognition of IPLC traditional knowledge-based uh, claims and also extend to genetic resources benefit sharing for countries who choose to forego the bilateral approach in exchange for assured streams from the fund. Importantly, it would not require tracking or tracing of DSI utilization to operate effectively. And I think such a system could, or mechanism could attain multiple policy objectives by reducing barriers to technology development um, and development using DSI and genetic resources, including by those who are often among the most disadvantaged in our global society. Um, it would also allow for reversing some negative effects of climate change by facilitating the creation of sustainable use approaches and inventions by researchers, um, including in provider countries, who would now have the increased capacity to harness the benefits of DSI-based technologies in the service of local or global problems. So can't see it all, but those are, are elements of, of my vision. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm accumulating um, um, many good I good ideas and, and many good, uh, I think, uh, legitimate questions as as well. But that's the nature uh, of a, of a vision. Um, and in fact, I think it can be quite useful. Uh, for, uh, next to Daniele, please. Thank you, Tim. And uh, good news. I've picked another free out of jail card. So let me give you my. Uh, vision of a truly global multilateral DS, uh, DSI benefit sharing system looking at stakeholders. So I, essentially I see a, a truly global multilateral DSI benefit sharing system as a decentralized federated system of networks and communities pursuing multi-level governance. And in a global system, these networks and communities uh, uh, would address the challenge of the ultimate challenge of increasing the collective capacities of the different actors within global initiatives to cooperate in the pursuit of the wider general interest. So why networks and why governance? Uh, well, I think that a global DSI benefit sharing system should focus on governance by creating cre creating and fostering networks as uh, stable horizontal articulations of interdependent but operationally autonomous actors uh, who interact with one uh, and, uh, and uh, another, of course, within a regulatory framework, but also setting self-regulating limits and that, uh, and that all contribute to the production of public, of public purpose. So I think that, um, of course, in public policy, we know that networks are recognized as important forms of multi-level governance. But if I look at DSI in particular, I think that the focus on governance cannot simply consist in selecting the best known or organizational model for a specific, pro for a specific problem. Uh, at, the, uh, at the beginning of this webinar team, we have mentioned the need for cross-fertilization among sectors. And I believe that constructing these governance networks would ultimately be a very valuable instrument for connecting, framing, brokering knowledge, and also exploring solutions uh, by stimulating the production and analysis of information about uh, an ongoing intervention by the actors involved themselves. Uh, the second element of my vision 
<clears throat> um, I think that ultimately a, glo a functioning global multilateral uh, DSI uh, benefit sharing system that is called to attain multiple policy uh, objectives, openness, equity, innovation, as to integrate responsible research and innovation into global governance frameworks. Not much will happen, in my opinion, without such integration of responsible research and innovation into global into uh, global governance frameworks. We know that responsible research and innovation focuses on the inclusion of broader uh, economic, ethical, and social considerations in the decision-making process of science, not only downstream at the innovation level, but also ex ante by sh uh, shaping and steering the innovation innovation process. So essential responsible research and in innovation would bring together under this global benefit sharing uh, uh, system, diverse actors who share the motivation and values to build bridges between the content and context of knowledge, of knowledge, of, of knowledge making. I'll finish by saying that uh, responsible research and innovations helps redress the longstanding de 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 deficits that have treated science as an apolitical and devoid of social and cultural context. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important that we integrate this perspective into global governance frameworks to essentially democratize science and innovation. Over to you, Tim. Thank you very much, Daniele, including for your last uh, comment, very, very thoughtful. Uh, Suri, please, uh, over to you, please. Thanks very much. Um... I, um, I I want to go back just very, very briefly to one of the previous questions to preface my remarks on, on, on this one uh, around capacity building, around non-monetary benefit sharing. Um, uh, and, and I want to emphasize one thing that I neglected to mention, which is that the sharing of uh, intellectual property and the sharing of technology through technology transfer, I think, is, is an area that um, uh, is a major, major concern in the health sector. Uh, that I certainly didn't spend enough time emphasizing, but is, is one of the big sticking points, I would say, in, in, in ongoing negotiations. And I think this is a key element of capacity building. Uh, and it's not just about money and it's not just about products. It is really about trying to build into the benefit sharing framework um, the obligation or the incentives to, uh, to share technologies. Um, and I think this is one of the reasons I flagged this is because I think it's a reminder of how um what's the word i'm looking for there, there are particularities in every sector uh and in the health sector uh, in the wake of the covid pandemic this this concern about um transferring technologies for vaccine development and production for example is is very very high on people's minds it may not be so relevant in other sectors i think there are yeah. a number of other um particularities i would say of DSI sharing in health uh, that may not be as important in other sectors. One would be speed, the, the huge importance of speed, and we're talking about within 24 to 48 hours trying to get uh, researchers to share DSI. Um, the tremendous interdependence that we see between countries when you can have a you know, respiratory fast-moving infection as we've seen over the last few years. The very difficult ethical questions around who gets access to health technology, life or death, um, uh, questions and, and the, the tremendous importance put on these technologies for restoring normal, normal social and economic life. And as I mentioned at the very beginning of this um, panel, the scale of the money involved, which I think dwarfs what we see in many other sectors where we're talking about tens of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars uh, in products alone and intellectual property value alone, uh, not to mention implications for economies. And, and I, I spend a few moments emphasizing this because I, I cannot imagine that all of those um, characteristics hold true for the many other sectors where sharing of DSI is important um, and can generate benefits. And, and so this leads me to very much support uh, Daniele's vision that I think he articulated very nicely just now, which is a network or a federated approach where you have different systems that, that actually uh, effectively meet the needs of different sectors will be necessary. But of course, we have a tremendous amount of um, uh, un 
unseized opportunities for learning that we that we need to do better on. And I wonder, is there a role for um, the CBD, for example, in bringing together what we might think of as a global ABS community um, to to try to facilitate that kind of learning uh, across this, these federated networks in a way that, um, at least in my experience, hasn't really happened yet. Thank you very much, Suri. And um, uh, your last note is um, very much sort of parallels my, um, my, my emerging thinking from this webinar, and that is the, the need to, I think, the absolute need um, by someone or some group to actually um, facilitate a, um, a, an envision, a visioning exercise, I mean, in the best possible use of the term. Um, because in my experience, uh, that's the last thing that uh, negotiators want to do, but it's actually the first thing that we should all do. Um, that leads to not necessarily a single single thought or a single solution, um, but it certainly can lead to, su to success uh, within and across forums. Uh, thank you to all the panelists. And we're now going to move to, um, to the questions and answers segment. I see we're running a little bit late, so my apologies for that. I know our uh, Suel and Hartmut have been busy following the chat. Uh, there's been, there are a lot of questions here. Um, I'm also aware that one of our, at least our panelists, has to leave shortly. So I'll move to you, Suel. Maybe you can um, formulate the first question or, or theme uh, for the panelists to have a look at. Thank you. Yes, uh, thanks a lot. And believe me, it was mind blowing to uh, compile all this. And uh, um, before I'm uh, coming up with a question, just to let you know what the different topics were. So it was really on definitions and it's on uh, dealing with IPLCs in terms of beneficiaries and say, um, the, the economic questions, uh, uh, the use of the benefits, uh, it would be uh, further on capacity development, scope issues uh, in general and in relation to the different fora. Um, how and uh, uh, to what extent may, may data banks be affected? Um, it is also on uh, what lessons learned can we uh, uh, already draw from uh, existing uh, mechanisms? Uh, it is um, how to deal with already existing um, uh, use of, of DSI. How could that be uh, covered? Uh, this uh, new um, link between artificial intelligence and DSI triggered questions, uh, as well as what is then the relation between the global uh, multilateral benefit sharing system uh, that we are discussing here and um, the one under Article 10 um, is a, a legal certainty uh, 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 possible at all. So really, really interesting questions. But um, I would start off with one, and that was all, already raised in the very beginning. I mean, is it worth all the effort in terms of how much will be in the pot? Yeah, so there was uh, there was a question on how much will be there and um, uh, that that uh, uh, may be uh, occurring from the multilateral benefit sharing mechanisms and in what relation is that also um, to be seen in terms of the exchange value and use value of uh, um, uh, the uh, the data and, and, and the products we are we're dealing with. So um, maybe we could have a bit of a reflection on okay, what can we expect here uh, in, in in terms of uh, um, benefits to be shared. Thanks uh, very much, Suel. Um, that's a, a brilliant summary of a, an awful lot of material. Let's go to, uh, let's start um, with maybe Margot. Uh, could could you give a little bit of a response and certainly looking to all the other panelists as well? Sorry, I was just putting in the chat that I've got to leave to go teach <laughs> each class. So um, just remind me very quickly of the question. What's in the pot? So it's really this question on how much will be there in terms of benefits to be shared and looking at also from this uh, um, uh, question of exchange value and use value. So uh, what is that that we can expect? Right, right. Um, great question. And, and that's why I started off my comments with encouraging us to think very broadly about um, who should contribute benefits um, and, and having a broad base of contributors because the need is great. And as Siri pointed out, there's there's money, lots of money being made. So I think it's important to have a broad base and enough um, coming into the pot that we can meet the various needs that are being identified. 
Um, but I apologize, I've, I've got to leave. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate. Uh, thank you very much, Margot. You certainly don't want to be late for your students. And then that's a very dangerous precedent to set in my experience. <laughs> Doesn't make it happen. No. Um, other panelists? Uh, yes, please, Daniel. Um, well, from a BBJ perspective, um, as I mentioned, the initial compromise is um, to tie the monetary benefit sharing payments for MGR and DSI from ABNJ to the um, to the overall budget to the assessed contributions um, and so the volume will depend to a certain degree on what will be the final budget and what will be the institutions funded by assessed contributions um, but just to give you kind of a range um, i think delegations had in mind um, something between sort of tens uh, 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 tens of millions 10 to 20 million as a maximum amount. And then for those, um, only the developed country, um, or, sorry, only the developed country contributions would count, and then it would be 50% of those. So you're you're gonna be in a sort of um, single, probably single digit million number, which is obviously not enough for the capacity building needs of the treaty. And that's why there are um, additional sources to the special fund, um, including, for example, yeah. um, a Jeff fund that has similar purposes, but also, um, yeah, in general, a need to uh, get additional sources of funding into the special fund in order to cover the overall capacity needs. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Anyone else on this before we move to another question? Tim, just uh, a quick a, a quick note. Uh, probably, if we're looking at if we're looking at money, I think this question is very very complex, and of course there are economists at at uh, work, work. There were also some calculations made in the context of the of our um, uh, again reform process of the material of the material system of the multilateral system of access and benefit sharing. But let's look at another pot as well. Let's look at the possibility, for instance, of uh, constructive contestation of the current policy outcomes by uh, actors. Let's look at the gradual regime uh, re 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 regime shifting uh, towards a possible uh, realignment of existing inst 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 institutions or the creation of new institutions. I think there is a lot at stake. I think it's a very big Part. I mean, if you look at the at the possibility of adjusting uh, be behaviors, institutional rules and standards, national international policies in order to build uh, co coherence between research, innovation, and equity. Well, in this case, I think that the pot is quite big, and I think it's an unmissable opportunity. Uh, thank you very much. Right, uh, we are running out of time. Uh, let's go back to uh, to the team, uh, uh, Hartmut, perhaps, or, or Suel. Have you got another uh, uh, question in the can? Yes, <clears throat> so I'm back. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> um, well, there was an internet glitch, so it's now it's done. Okay. Um, well, I think um, one um, interesting um, questions, one interesting questions which we like to throw into the panel is of course um how yeah how how should these i be defined what what would be a good way to reach a definition because um it was not done by purpose in the cbd cop and i um, have um, a short uh, comment in the chat on that um and for example in my opinion and at the bsi definition would also be very crucial to define what is a DSI product. So, and for what product do you need to share the benefits? Um, that is very closely connected. Um, thank you very much. So, uh, definition of DSI, or maybe it should be GSD. I'm not sure. Um, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a good question. Um, it's not an easy, uh, easy one to answer. In my experience, and often it's the last. Um, question to be answered in an international negotiation, which is a little perverse. Um, and sometimes the, the, the second last question is, what is the actual objective of the treaty being uh, being negotiated? Uh, that's enough for me. Anyone on uh, on definitions, on defi the definition, please? Yes, please, Sari. 
Um, yes, I, I just, uh, I don't know if this will be satisfying, but what I wanted to say is we clearly need governance mechanisms to continue to update these. And that what we understand to be important benefits, for example, today may not be exactly what are the important benefits that are needed tomorrow. And we've seen that certainly in the, in, in the health uh, context, where, as I was mentioning before, the emphasis on technology transfer is much higher now than it would have been, uh, than it was certainly prior to COVID, where it was felt that, you know, donations of vaccine doses was, was enough. Similarly, you know, when, when the influenza framework was negotiated, DSI was not included, GSD you know, data was not included. Um, and, and it's the evolution of technology, as we all know, um, that has made this such an important issue. Uh, I think a couple of people, um, their ears perked up when they heard Professor Bagley say, you know, AI may render DSI less useful or even useless in the future. Um, I don't think we're anywhere close to that when, it, when we look at the role of such data for the development of, of vaccines and diagnostics. Um, I think we're, we're very, very far from that and regulators rely very heavily on real world genomic sequencing data, not only to develop products, but to um, assure that they are, they are um, you know, of quality and, and effective. Um, but certainly we can imagine a future in 10 years where some new technology comes along that may upend the entire system. So for me, a key question is, how much can we agree on specific benefits or definitions today? But to what extent do we need to ensure that the governance mechanisms allow for the flexibility so that we are not having these long drawn out multi-year fights every five to 10 years um, uh, to, to define new terms or to, to deal with new technological realities? Can we build that kind of anticipation into the way we, we govern these regimes more broadly? I think this will be important in the pandemic instrument and, and perhaps beyond. Thank you very much, Suri. I'm afraid we have to cut it uh, here. Um, uh, just simply to underscore uh, the, the last point made. Uh, yeah, I think we're, we really are an era, not just in terms of GSD, DSI, or ABS for that matter, an era where we're really confronting the need to for, um, for change uh, and responsiveness in an international system, whether it's a treaty based or not, uh, to um, developments in science and technology. Uh, re we're really at the at, at the front end front end of that. So there's plenty of room for innovation. Um, so that's a very great point uh, to to end on. Uh, so again, to cut you uh, cut you short, panelists, uh, my my heartfelt gratitude to all of you. I very very much appreciate your contributions. It's been it's been for me excellent an excellent panel, and thank you very much. Uh, so we now move to the uh, final comments, please, um, Subek. Yes, uh, and thanks a lot for uh, Tim for for having um, moderated this very very interesting um, panel. And uh, I think uh, a lot we got out of that. A lot we got out of the chat. And um, on the chat, uh, there was the question, of course, uh, could it be copied and made available in the report? We will uh, we will have internally the possibility to copy it and uh, we'll um, annex it to the report in an anonymized manner so uh, that we uh, are also then in conformity with the EU data protection uh, regulations. Um, um, we... Uh, are really, really grateful also to the panelists um, here. And I'm quite sure that this is not going to be the last time um, that uh, um, we will bother you on um, sharing your thinking and uh, also your expertise on the subject matter. Um, so thanks a lot uh, to, to you. Uh, apologies to the entire group for the technical glitch. Uh, Hartmut has already mentioned it, but um, um, the slides uh, on the Comparison of where we, uh, the, the different uh, fora are standing um, will be also shared then um, uh, with the report. Uh, the report will be made uh, available uh, on the website of the ABS initiative. Um, we are also thinking of, because there are many uh, newcomers um, now after uh, the uh, framework had been adopted, new staff, um, uh, that we compile a uh, collection of uh, material, uh, newcomer material, but also expert material, and uh, we'll share that uh, in due time with the participants of uh, um, that uh, um, webinar so of course the virtual participants and um, in that regard we would uh, uh, also to um, 
improve to see how um, useful you found this uh, webinar, ask you to take part in a very short evaluation um, after that uh, webinar, which uh, will pop up when you are um, actually logging out. So once again, um, thanks a lot. Uh, all the um, questions, topics uh, that arose, we took duly note of them. Um, there is, as you may know, a um, a primer on digital sequence information, which is also on our website, as well as uh, a little video DSI simply explained, but we are in the process now of uh, updating um, the um, um, technical brochure on DSI, where many of the questions um, that have been raised today hopefully will also be reflected. So thanks a lot uh, to, uh, to all of you. Um, the participants, the panelists, the moderator, my colleagues, the technical team in the background um, with uh, Yannick, Andreas and uh, Katrin. I hope I haven't uh, forget any, uh, someone. And uh, you will hear from us uh, with the new uh, webinars uh, in the pipeline on modalities, on, for example, IPLCs. These are some of the uh, topics that we have in um, in mind. So thanks a lot and uh, enjoy the remainder of the day. Thank you.